All right, here we go. It's time to review Diablo 4. So I want to get a couple of key things out of the way before we jump into things. Number one, what I played was a full review build, which means it included the entire game, everything content wise that you can expect to see at release, minus any likely day one patches and minus the cash shop, which I will get to, don't worry. Ooh. Number two, I leveled up as a sorcerer playing through the entire campaign. Very I smart. into end game and spent about half of my total play time checking out those systems, which include the nightmare dungeons, hell tides, whispers, fields of hatred, world bosses, and the capstone okay. dungeons. Dungeons. And number three, we only had nine days to play, after which they shut down the servers and deleted everything. So you're telling me that dude hit level 100 in less than nine days? Holy shit! Thing. So for that reason, uh, no, I didn't max out my character because that will take hundreds of hours. But I did go through all of the paces. I was grinding for gear, mm -hmm. bouncing between every activity, and progressing the Paragon board while continuously taking on harder challenges. So okay. I saw what the end game consists of and got a good feel for the gameplay loop, or basically what it is we'll be doing on a regular basis. So between this review build, the various beta tests, and previews from last year, I've played over 100 hours of Diablo 4 at oh, this wow. point, and 100 hours is a good chunk a of lot. time but also for any arpg loot game or mmo it's closer to zero hours than the total number of hours people tend to spend with these kind of games the point of which is to say just like any other live service game just like with an mmo yeah I every review is a screenshot right like reviews never really apply to anything that happens after the day the review comes out because the game changes every day and also even whenever the game doesn't change, that is a change in itself can't really with full confidence tell you exactly how Diablo 4 is going to feel 3, 6, or 12 months down the road yeah, because we're not there yet no. and a lot of that is going to hinge on the quality of their regular quarterly updates or... What, their... what did I say that was confusing? You said no update is an update? Sure, so let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Like a good example of this is Shadowlands in Season 1. Shadowlands in Season 1 received no updates, whereas Shadowlands Season 1 was good, but over time the quality of the game deteriorated because there was a lack of updates. Does that make sense? So that's what I meant to say, and that's an example of what I'm talking about seasons but i do have an idea of how much time i am likely to spend with the base game judging off of the amount of content that's here at release the level of difficulty and the progression systems currently in place and how much time Makes is sense. that well is. Let's talk a bit about the game first. So I'm not gonna bore you with all the basics. This yeah. is an ARPG, it's a Diablo game. You Imagine likely know it. what to expect and how it starts. We pick from one of five classes, the Necro, Barb, Sork, Druid, and Rogue. And there's a bit of character customization. Then you select your mode. I still think they could make the character customizer better normal or hardcore and finally you pick the difficulty which in most cases my advice will be to start with world tier one unless you begin two shotting packs of elites or if you just want to bump up the difficulty yeah i'm doing world tier two challenge. whenever it comes lastly out. you name your character and off you go now i'm assuming most of you watching this probably played at least some of the open beta in which case yep. you have a pretty clear grasp on how the campaign is structured and how things work in the open world but if not though i'll give you a little rundown so you get the main story quest this is going to take you on a guided path through the entire game. Uh, we start out in the snowy region known as Fractured Peaks, mm -hmm. and then after a short prologue, you will arrive at the main town of Kiovashad. Here you're going to find the game's major vendors, quest givers, various crafting and upgrade systems. Once you arrive to Kiovashad, the main story quest actually branches out, giving you three different choices. And this really? is what Blizzard oh, was referring to when they that. said that Diablo 4 had a non-linear campaign. Although, do keep in mind, you have to eventually do all of the main story quest in every zone. So even so if you kind of like how bfa questing was it sounds where like you could do drusvar first or last but you still had to do drusvar choose to skip past fractured peaks to start you will eventually have to come back anyway fact is in most cases it's probably just best to stay in fractured peaks mm -hmm. than run by foot all the way to the other zones That's really the point. only reason i would see to leave fractured peaks after the prologue if a you have class mechanic quests that are over there yeah. and you want to go get those because yes they provide a pretty big boost to power or b if mm -hmm. there's some like dungeon legendary aspect that you really really want for your build early on and you can't wait otherwise yes it's 
probably best to just stick to Fracture Peaks, play through those campaign missions, and then move on once you finish them. So as you're doing the main story quest, which will have you following through the narrative of the game from one beat to the next, you're also just moving through the open world. And this hands down is one of my favorite aspects of Diablo 4. It's got a massive- Yeah, I'm a very big fan of the open world also. I think open world is fucking great. I love the idea of it and I'm glad they're doing it open world map with zero loading screens as you move between zones That's and you'll explore huge. various I didn't know biomes wow. checking out different points of interest with a bunch of different things to do there are five distinct regions in the game each of which have their own theming based off of some real ro world locations with unique monsters and activities and this All is actually something that i don't want to spoil to you uh, like i'm not going to give you a lot of the specifics of the interesting stuff yeah, i see sure. in, the, in the open world mainly because the exploration and discovery of everything while playing here well, is a, a big fast chunk ass of what horse. i enjoyed the game world, first of all, is huge. And I mean, it's absolutely massive. I didn't even clear every single area of the Holy map. Holy fuck, like keep in mind the beta was just this. It was just this area right here. Uh, I'd say this is a pretty substantial world. After a full week of playing the game, mm -hmm. it's just very, very large, tons of space, and there's a large variety of things to see. As for things to do, well, it is an open world game, and if you played Fractured Peaks, you know pretty much everything. The, just the variety is mixed up a bit. Besides the overworld being full of various types of monsters to smash, it's also consisting of dungeons, events, strongholds, side quests, and collectibles. So you got all this stuff out in the open world to discover and engage with, uh, which you will come across just naturally as you play through the campaign and as it takes you through each of the zones, guiding you from one region to the next. Oh, and also the mounts. These are unlocked via a side quest when you get about halfway through. Uh, somewhere around level 35 or 40, I think, is when we got it. And when okay. you get the mount, it is a massive help, really, especially since the game and the world is so big. They've got like a basic gallop speed, but also a dash, which will boost your movement temporarily. It's got three charges that just constantly refill with time. And every class... Yeah, I think giving the mount extra abilities to keep people actively playing the game while they're on their mount is really good and it actually makes it to where like you're traveling it turns it into a game lost ark does that and it definitely makes movement feel way better it's kind of like dragon riding versus normal flying also has a unique dismount attack so yeah the game is really big there's a lot of activities and there's plenty of stuff to keep you busy but remember the main thing if you want to progress into end game is simply finishing the story. So playing through the entire campaign took me around 11 hours, and I was level 43 when turning in the final quest. But please bear in mind, I was playing at a fairly quick pace, but not as fast as possible, given I knew- Yeah, I think I'll probably do the campaign in two days. Like, I'm not gonna go and try to, like, speed run it. I'm gonna probably do it in, like, maybe two or three days. Three, three could be possible that the review window was limited and I only had so much time to play. I was just mostly interested in getting to end game quickly just for the sake of seeing it and learning about yeah. it and checking out the different systems. So that said, between the campaign and exploration of this huge open world with all the stuff we talked about, I could see it taking many more hours to complete. Like I could easily see people spending 30, 40, or even 50 hours just doing open world stuff in addition as they're moving throughout the campaign. That is certainly possible. But on the flip side, I could also see people- yeah, there's also a ton of other side quests too it's not just the main campaign nation the campaign in way fewer than 11 hours because i wasn't exactly beelining it i did spend some time doing some side stuff doing some dungeons exploration public events things like that yeah. so how long it takes you to go through the campaign is totally just going to depend on your play style because the campaign is weaved into the open world and as we touched on there is a lot to the open world i mean honestly you could play for 100 plus hours before you finish the campaign if you're just also doing all the open world stuff as you move throughout. But once you finish the campaign- I think I'll try to finish it like at a reasonable pace, you know? Like, I don't want to just make it take forever, but like then I'll do the open world stuff after that. But I think most people are probably going to- like most streamers and serious players are going to finish the campaign on day one it's time for endgame. And this is where, as ARPG and MMO players would say, this is where 
the real game begins, right? So the first system that you're introduced to is the Tree of Whispers. On its face, it's pretty straightforward. Th these are rotating objectives that pop up all over the world, spread out between the different zones. So each task that you have will be worth a set number of favors. Once you collect 10 favors, you return to the tree and you collect a reward. Now, when I first heard about this system, I kind of wrote it off because I basically assumed it was just like any side quest, uh, daily quest system or the bounty system from Diablo 3, right? And yes, in a lot of ways it is, is, but also, as I was playing, I found myself really enjoying the fact that this system pushed me to revisit old areas, but then also brought me to explore new ones that I hadn't yet seen. And these objectives are also always in these clusters. It essentially takes a few areas within each zone and will give you a grouping of mm -hmm. activities in one particular space. So these activities will include completing a dungeon, clearing a cellar, killing a variety of enemies in the area, turning in these collectibles, and then finishing one of those open world events that we discussed. So while the exact activities are constantly changing, their locations and which ones are available are rotating on a regular basis, and there will be multiple clusters up at any given time, the general structure of each grouping of the Tree of Whisper quest is what I just listed. And the harder objectives also reward more favors. So for example, if you clear a cellar, it's worth one favor, but if you do a dungeon, it's worth five, and you just have to reach 10 before you can go collect your reward from the tree. And this was- They really just just have them called Balrogs. I, I'm just looking at it right there. Great way to fill up low level pieces. It was a great way to level up and get experience. It was a great way to see more of the world. Overall, even though it is just like a daily quest system, just like a bounty system, because the world is so big and because I hadn't ever seen mm -hmm. all of it, and because it was a good source of experience and a good source of filling up low level loot pieces, I really yeah. liked engaging with that and constantly going out into the world, doing this cluster of activities, going back to the tree, getting experience, getting loot, then going out to another spot and just continuing continuously doing this over and over again. So the Tree of Whispers is the first and only end game activity that you can do immediately after clearing the campaign. The rest of it is actually locked behind World Tier 3, which in order to progress to, you have to clear the Capstone Dungeon. So the Capstone Dungeon- Yeah, I think the Capstone Dungeon is really cool. I really like that because it's like, you can't do the Capstone Dungeon in a group. This is my understanding. You have to actually, you have to beat it on your own. You have to be good at the game is the set level activity that basically acts as a barrier to you progressing world you can group? enemies oh, inside have really? a hard locked level which if you oh, are I didn't too know far that below okay. is going to be really difficult so when i finished the campaign as mentioned i was level 43 the capstone mm -hmm. dungeon to go from world tier 2 to 3 is set to level 50 now i tried immediately going in but i just wasn't doing enough damage and enemies would kill me too quickly so i spent a few hours doing those tree of whisper quests yeah. uh, leveling up gearing up Ooh. and then once i got to level 50 I jumped back into the capstone and I'm gonna be honest with you I think this thing has been a bit oversold in the past as being some massive challenge in re it's probably not gonna be super hard for most people yeah like I, I really I really don't think it's gonna be that hard reality it's just like a slightly longer than normal dungeon run i mean there are some cool enemies inside that you fight but for the most part it is really straightforward and it just acts as like a level or a gear check i mean mm -hmm. don't get me wrong it was like somewhat difficult at times but there really weren't any interesting surprises or real new mechanics that i noticed compared to any other dungeon run in the game um just kind of some like tough grouping of enemies at times although the boss fight was really cool uh, like a lot of the other boss fights in Diablo 4. I really enjoyed it. I'll definitely give them that. Speaking of- I hope so. The boss fights that I've done in Diablo 4, I think have been kind of bad. Like, I I'm gonna be real. I, I don't think they're that great. Uh, they didn't really function properly. It it's just, you know, like, okay, they're, they're kind of lacking. Yeah, like, not none of it was, like, super crazy or hard. Which I know I haven't really discussed boss fights thus far. For one, we're not yeah, going to be revealing them too. for spoiler's sake, like the names of the campaign bosses. But I will tell you this much. The big ones that are in the campaign, as uh -huh. well as the boss in the capstone dungeon, I thought they were pretty good. Really interesting, both in the boss design and mechanic design departments. I just thought uh, many of these were interesting, cool encounters that I really liked. Okay, so once you finish the world tier 2 capstone dungeon, you then unlock access to world tier 3. And with that... 
you gain access to the rest of the end game. And that is including the Nightmare Dungeons and Hell Tides, as well as when you're introduced to the Champion Monsters, which add an extra level of challenge with their new affixes and resistances. And this is when you're gonna start seeing sacred and unique items dropping. So sacred items are just like higher item level versions of everything below Legendary. Whereas- Yeah, like I saw that, yeah, there's like a parenthesis around it. So you know which items are worth picking up and which ones are not. The unique items are altogether different. Uh, these will drop with set in stone stat types and affixes, which will just change depending on the item level that they drop at. And some of these uniques come with really cool abilities. For example, I found the Ice Heart Pants, which made it so that enemies who died while frozen would have up to a 20% chance to unleash a new Frost Nova, which would then basically just chain freeze everything. As I was blowing up groups of enemies, I, I Frost Nova them, I blow them up, and then ones that die have a pretty good chance to blow up a new another frost nova and it just keeps happening it's really really yeah, cool it sounds like herald of ice that's cool stuff so uh yeah anyways world tier three better loot starts dropping more interesting loot starts dropping there's harder enemies to fight and you've got more things mm -hmm. to do and it was really at this point that i felt like the game started to open up and the combat was getting a lot more engaging because okay. it was more difficult because there were new activities and all of that one of those activities being the hell tides so hell tides rotate on and off every other hour this basically takes over two large regions in one of the game's five main zones these entire areas turn red essentially like with hellfire raining from the sky this is an actual mechanic sometimes you'll have to dodge it as it falls down That's and then cool. enemies within the hell tide drop this resource called cinders so basically you just go into the hell tide farm groups of enemies do events and kill bosses which these areas do have these unique roaming hell tide specific bosses all of this gives you cinders you gather up as much as possible within the hour that's available and then you take those cinders to these chests located all around the hell tide and there will be different types of chests for weapons for armor for rings and amulets so you turn your senders in you get a random drop of the type that's listed on the chest you'll know ahead of time if it's like a two-handed weapon if it's a helm if they're pants if it's a ring or amulet you'll see what the chests are you turn in however many cinders you collected that are required for that chest and you get a random drop and these yeah, do it's seem kind of like another way that you can buy gear uh to gamble sounds like chores oh it definitely will be chores over time i mean for sure it's like predictive farming. Yeah, you're Gamba. You're doing Gamba for a specific piece have a very high likelihood of dropping legendary or higher items mm -hmm. on multiple occasions i would actually get several sacred pieces from a single Holy chest which fuck. is really good and it seems like hell tides are great if you are looking for specific legendary or sacred aspects for your particular build as it lets you turn in exactly for the type of gear that you're looking for you just have to find the right chest within the hell tide uh, and sometimes if you are really lucky an area can be both within a hell tide and also have tree of whisper quests located in there at the same time so like in which max, case you're yeah. just getting like a ton of value from farming in that particular area great opportunity when those things sync up to mm -hmm. farm a bunch of gear it's really cool really cool and next up are the nightmare dungeons and this is really like the bread and butter of diablo 4's end game it is the one main activity that has an ever increasing difficulty as you continuously unlock higher and higher sigils which are basically like keys that open up the nightmare dungeons and these higher levels push enemy monster levels higher and higher above the max character level of a i've always been of the uh, of the mind that i like the idea that you can do um like you can beat the hardest content in the game i'm actually not a big fan of infinitely scaling content and this actually doesn't have infinitely scaling content it caps at 100 as far as i know like it's not like it goes above that so i think that's good 100 this is the progressive difficulty thing that you'll right. be working on as you continue leveling gearing up and powering up you're just trying to push higher level nightmare dungeons that's like the main goal basically so how does it work well it's pretty simple you will start off getting random low level sigils you'll just get them as you play after mm -hmm. you progress into world tier three and this will grant you access to a nightmare version of one particular dungeon in the game so the nightmare variants will add a bunch of modifiers changing things up a bit there's going to be some sort of buff for your character like it's sometimes it'll increase a certain type of damage or increase your attack speed it'll increase your resistances making you more tanky but then also there are going to be more enhancements for the enemies making yeah what is this here nightmare portals pouring out dangerous monsters that actually could be a buff based off of your build uh, monsters deal 30 percent of physical damage is shadow damage that's a lot 
uh, non-boss, 1.5% maximum life per second regen. Like, that sounds like nothing, really. Monsters become unstoppable whenever life drops. Yeah, th this one's not really that bad. Yeah, it's kind of like mapping and PoE, yeah. Them tougher, making them deal more damage, even in a lot of cases making them explode when they die or leave pools of damage on the ground. But the most interesting thing is that these will also sometimes add an additional dungeon mechanic. So this includes something like the Drifting Shade, where you'll get this little shade that chases the player, exploding when it reaches them. This will deal damage, but then also create a field on the ground that dazes if you walk into it. Mm -hmm. Or there's this rock pillar that will follow closely behind you the entire time, pulsating damage damage whenever it gets close sometimes there that sounds fucking annoying are ones that will have lightning strikes periodically come down uh -huh. and you have to get under this floating artifact in order to prevent the damage oh, or there are that ones that will sense. have portals open up and constantly streaming in new monsters the main point yeah, of doing these nightmare dungeons is to beyond dropping loot at the end of them to upgrade the glyphs for your paragon board which brings okay. us to the paragon board upon reaching level 50 you stop gaining new skill points and start progressing the paragon board so for every level you unlock four new paragon points to spend on your board and this you can see the refund cost is pretty reasonable like 3,000 gold to refund a point is like not really that much board is basically an additional layer of character power progression outside of gear. So you begin with your class's starter board. This is set, locked in place, mm -hmm. and you start at the bottom and you work your way up. There will be a bunch of normal nodes that will add minimal so increases yeah, to things like strength, it intelligence, scales. willpower, or dexterity. Then also magic nodes that provide stronger boosts to various different stat types. Uh -huh. There are then rare nodes that provide even more powerful boost and legendary nodes, and these basically act like additional pieces of gear as yeah. Yeah, the legendary nodes are the cool ones. Ward what amounts to something equivalent to a legendary yeah. aspect. And then also dotted all throughout these boards are these empty glyph slots. You're going to play, glyphs are going to drop, and these things provide pretty big modifiers and yep. enhancements, basically, to any of the They're nodes like within the range of the glyph. So depending on the glyphs that you have, you'll have different glyphs that do different things. And if you mm -hmm. find ones that are good for your build, you'll slot them into one of the empty glyph nodes on the Paragon board, and they're going to provide a really good boost to all of the nodes nodes that surround them and these are really strong enhancements uh, as mentioned they can be further powered up by running those light nightmare dungeons okay so, so there it is right there so seven six to seven so these are like the uh those legendary gems they had in diablo 3 grants 100 percent skill bonus to all rare nodes within range that's plus 10 percent okay yeah this makes sense but once you get a glyph that you really like and that's good for your build odds are you're going to want to spend some time farming the nightmare dungeons uh -huh. specifically to level up the glyph in a lot of ways it's pretty similar to what running rifts was in diablo 3 which you were doing to level up gems yeah you're running nightmare dungeons in diablo 4 to level up paragon glyphs all right uh so a couple more end game Incredible. things we're going to touch on first up the world bosses if you fought the world boss in diablo 4's open beta you know exactly what to expect with these the boss will periodically spawn into the game you're going to get a 30 minute warning before they show up you go to the area fight the boss and collect the you loot the so boss, in the open beta the we yeah. fought ashava the pestilent uh, in the review build i fought ashava the pestilent and that was it. Uh, in all wow. my time playing, I actually Exciting. saw the world boss spawn three times. And every time, because I was unlucky, it was Ashava. Now, at the very least, there was some variety here for me because Ashava was located in other spawn locations. There will be set essentially boss arenas located around the map. So I fought Ashava, not in the Fractured Peaks at least, but I just kept fighting Ashava. I didn't see anyone else. Fortunately, Liam was playing as well and fought the oh, other bosses. Shit. So we know what they do. Oh, this is that one boss from the, like, this is like the first trailer they put out for the game it was this guy first up there is avarice the gold cursed he's got various melee attacks slams and aoe's uh, he would stomp on the ground and puke which you would have to dodge occasionally then he would teleport away and slam in when he teleports back into the arena and uh -huh. then also he would form up these statues that occasionally would burst into these golden aoe pools this boss was actually pretty straightforward and seems to be the least interesting of the world bosses in the game and then there was wandering death when he shows up he's got this sound wave attack 
in which he would uh, push it out and then summon it back towards him, damaging anything in his path. We'd also okay. summon up these large tornadoes that would spin around the arena. He had I mean, this the guy charge up beam cool. attack, which he would shoot out of both hands while spinning around. This was really cool looking, honestly. All of this just got progressively more intense to the point where eventually the boss was shooting out three of those beam attacks, which I thought was really cool looking. And That's that badass. is actually it. Ashava, Avarice, and Wandering Death, as far as we know, are the only three world bosses that are in the game at release. So this is a bit of a... Yeah, I don't think world bosses need to be that big of a deal. And like uh, in Lost Ark, like they reused a lot of world bosses anyway too. Like there's the world boss and like Pride Home is the same one in Orvis Island. Uh, I think there's one on the island, like the Mech Warrior is the same one that's in Arthentine. And like, it's not really that big of a deal. Also world bosses are like, I mean, they're really cool, but they're, they're throwaway content. Like these are not supposed to be challenging or hard disappointment here. One of the handful of disappointments I have with Diablo 4. I'll also say I was hoping that the other world bosses would have some more interesting mechanics, but everything seems pretty straightforward. Liam was able to solo the two additional bosses. Wow. None of these bosses seemed particularly challenging. It seems like the hardest part about yeah, these- Yeah, they have to make it like that because these are effectively loot pinatas world boss fights will just be you dealing with the other players in your instance scaling up the health of the boss and yeah. if they don't carry their weight uh, that's going to be a bit of a pain all right and the final big end game activity are the fields of hatred or basically the pvp zones in diablo 4 there are two of them in the game and i'm going to be honest with you i'm a little disappointed because they are relatively small the basic mechanic is really straightforward there are these two fields of hatred you go there killing enemies or bosses or doing events in the region will drop these shards you collect the shards and then there are basically these extraction points there's like three or four of them in each one of the pvp zones they're located on the corners of the map you go to the extraction point dump your shards and then after some 45 second timer the shards turn into red dust and then you're able to use that red dust as a currency for vendors that sell cosmetics and gear it increases they're... damage taken but increases damage taken from monsters it's like a gambling vendor version of the pvp okay. currency so that's a basic system and then of course pvp happens within here Unfortunately, during the review build, there was- Look wasn't at that, by the way. Look at that damage. You guys saw that? That's Whirlwind system. Barbarian. And then, of course, PvP happens within here. Unfortunately, during the review build, there Ooh. wasn't a lot of PvP that took place, so I am reserving final judgments. Oh, I mean, obviously, that was the fact PvE. that they didn't actually get to experience PvP took away from the experience, but I'm also just surprised by how really small these zones are. It just feels like they might get really boring because they're just such- pretty tiny arenas they're mm -hmm. very tiny spots but whatever i'm reserving final judgment until full release when ideally we get to see these things in full swing with tons of other people and everyone's getting one shot right with all that said here is the basic end game loop and what you're doing and why you're going to probably want to do the world boss and that gathering legion big open world event whenever they happen to pop up you should also most likely do hell tides whenever they pop up if you are looking to farm specific slots legendary aspects or trying to get sacred items in those particular slots. Hell like are playing great Diablo You will be again. fairly regularly wanting to farm Nightmare Dungeons in order to level up those glyphs for your Paragon board. Uh -huh. And you're going to want to do Tree of Whisper. Drop rates buff? Nah, the drop rates aren't buffed, man. Like, they were just... <laughs> you weren't supposed to be getting legendary every 10 minutes in Act 1. But, like, once you get up to higher levels, you're going to be getting legendaries all the time if you're looking to level up because they're great for experience as well as filling specific low item level gear slots and you'll do pvp probably mm -hmm. just for the fun of it and that is the loop that i found myself doing i would when i felt like leveling up i would do tree of whispers or if i just wanted to explore and fill up empty uh, low level gear slots i would do tree of whispers whenever i saw the world boss or gathering legion i would go do that when helltide was up I would go do that, and I would just then, when Helltide or the World Boss slash Legion event wasn't up, I would rotate between Tree of Whisper farming, Nightmare Dungeon farming, and going into the PvP zone, and as I just said, seeing nobody, unfortunately. Uh, so one big mission from testers. the review build was the shop. They didn't have the shop in the game, but they did send us press kit that had screenshots as well as some B-roll of what the shop will look like okay. with what they are saying is the exact prices they plan to launch the shop with. So how does it look? Well, the premium paid currency that you can buy. So we have the traditional, uh, you're getting, okay, so you can get, for $100, you get uh, 11,000. Okay. 
Where's the 800% value though? Ranges from costing up to two dollars to up to one hundred dollars. Yeah, from two dollars to ten dollars, every one dollar equals one hundred currency. And then once you reach that twenty-five dollar bundle, that's when they start adding those bonus free currencies bonus, bonus, in addition bonus. to the twenty-five hundred that you would have got otherwise. And yeah. the point of this, of course, is to try to incentivize you to pony up to spend for that hundred dollar bundle. So this one says right here, it says two thousand eight hundred. So how much is two thousand eight hundred? 2800 is $25. Okay. And the point of this, of course, is to try to incentivize you to pony up to spend for that right. hundred dollar bundle, as that is the one that gives the greatest but, yeah, amount you, of Yeah, you're free losing money unless you spend a hundred dollars as time. it is often called in these cash shops. So the cosmetics that we saw ranged in price from thirteen dollars for That's this dress to kill rogue set, all the way up to twenty-eight dollars for the Wraith Lord Necro set, and twenty-eight dollars appears to be the highest, most expensive cosmetic set that I saw in at least what they showed us. And there's so far. So far, they'll have the legendary and ancient sets, and those will be like 35 and like $45 everything in between a mix of variety of combinations with different cosmetic slots some of them will even include things like emotes and markings for oh, your wow. character and then there was also this thing called oh, an wow. add-on that you could purchase one that we saw was the crypt hunter add-on which would give you a mount skin a couple of cosmetics and then 800 platinum and that yeah but like does it make the mount go faster though start your hellish journey through sanctuary with the crypt hunter pack including lias the ice howl mount beginning uh beginnings end and protean axe weapon cosmetics and 800 platinum easy level one mount no it says mount access must be unlocked in game before using mounts so that that's not true but um okay this i i don't give a fuck this is fine with me that cost $20. So, I mean, looking at this, it's pretty much everything that I expected. It's like a regular old cash shop. It doesn't really seem all that surprising. We knew this was going to be in the game. It's, you know, yeah, sure. seeing $28 bundles in a game that's $70 at its cheapest and one that's also going to be selling a season pass in uh, mid-July, so like a month and a half after release. It's a lot of layers of uh, monetization, but, you know, we knew this was coming this part of the game is not at all surprising so that is a recap no, i don't really give a fuck about that i mean like as long as the game is good then i it doesn't really matter i mean uh, like every game is gonna have microtransactions if you want updates for it that's just how it is like if you don't like it don't play it right yeah that's just the way it is you don't have to buy any of it no no you don't have to buy it there's no advantage it provides of the game and the systems i do want to touch on some of the early dislikes and concerns that we okay. had from playing the review build while i do think some of the boss fights are really interesting they're also incredibly easy we really didn't see anything that was all that challenging it seems like the most challenging most difficult encounter in this game is going to be that pinnacle level 100 boss but the capstone dungeon bosses weren't all that difficult the campaign yeah i, I want to see the uh i want to see Valton in this game I don't want to see Ficus, <laughs> but I want to see Valton. That would be fucking awesome. Bosses weren't all that difficult. The world bosses aren't all that difficult. And that is all really disappointing. I also feel like some of these counters, while they were interesting, they didn't feel all that unique or, or inspired, really. And I felt like playing a game like Lost Dark, I, I and faced encounters and boss fights that had much more interesting and fresher takes on ARPG boss fight encounters. A lot of the boss yeah. fights in this game just kind of felt like variations of the bosses that I fought in Diablo 3. And I feel like that is a bit of a shame. I feel like Blizzard should have taken more risks. And and that's probably one of my biggest critiques about you. even the bosses in the uh, what are they called the abyss dungeons like Alric, for example like the poseidon guy in uh in tier two in lost ark was fucking crazy good uh Brelshaza, even in the uh, phantom palace was crazy good the king was crazy good and like the first part of phantom palace uh vel cruz was really good and the arc of arrogance uh let's see where are the other ones uh i would say albion was okay in orisa pervisa yeah i mean there's there are probably a couple of other ones but 
I mean, yeah, the Lost Ark bosses are just way more interesting and way better designed. I mean, it's and and by the way, it's it's not even remotely close. Diablo 4 in general. I really like the core of what mm -hmm. is here. It is super competent. It is fun to play and I plan to play it, but I feel like they played it very, very, very safe and they didn't take a lot of chances when it yeah. comes to mechanics and systems within the game. They just built a good feeling ARPG. They made it open world and MMO light shared world, which I love both of those things, but it doesn't feel like it's really pushing the boundaries outside of that structure that they've built here. Uh, some of the content in the game with things like the strongholds and the campaign bosses, they don't have ways to replay them really. Like they don't reset making them repeatable, which is a shame because they are some of the cooler things in the game. I would love an opportunity to replay strongholds and fight campaign bosses again because both of those things are enjoyable. Don't strongholds reset after a period of time? I think that they do, don't they? Somebody says yes, somebody says no. Okay, yeah, well, I guess we'll have to find out able to engage with but we only get to do them one time around uh -huh. feels like the scaling is a bit wonky a lot of people kind of complained about this a bit in the betas but it's true for release as well you'll basically fluctuate between things being incredibly hard but way too easy all depending on the gear that drops maybe that's just yeah. working as intended because this is a loot game but the the scaling and the difficulty of things does not feel consistent and smooth it feels like you hit these hard walls and then all of a sudden everything's way too easy and that kind of yo-yos back and forth while you play speaking of which tier four level levels out a ton and once you get good gear it is no longer difficult and it really doesn't take that long tier four as a reminder is the highest tier difficulty you get to tier four and you hit this point where you gear up and everything is just easy and then basically the rest of the game for the rest of the time is really easy at that point with the only exception and it's still good at least that this is here is those nightmare dungeons because as i mentioned you will just keep getting higher and higher level keys that keep pushing the monster levels higher and making things more challenging and i don't think that's too big of a deal personally like i'm gonna be honest like i i don't really think that's a big deal especially for it to come out on release that's fine uh like you can't expect it to have like 15 different fucking pinnacle bosses like poe has basically greater rifts yeah i mean like as long as they have a few bosses and they're working towards that i'll be happy that is the uh, ever progressing difficult it's not uh -huh. infinite progressing but it is ever progressing up to a point because eventually you'll hit level 100 you'll get all your best gear slots you'll get your best rolls and then even those max level nightmare dungeons aren't going to feel that hard at that point yeah. at least that is my assumption class balance still feels out of whack here and i'm not talking specifically about end game balance but while leveling up and while this doesn't really matter in the long run it's pretty stark difference when you start off playing something like say the rogue or the sorceress in my example and and then you try switching to level up a barbarian or a druid both of those classes just feel yeah. terrible to start now the good news yeah i think that's such an l for blizzard there's no reason that a class should play like trash like there's obviously like some sort of like internal uh like tuning knob that changes the amount of damage that you do every single level i don't know why they can't just tune it higher for druid and barbarian to start with i i don't under i don't get it is that they get really strong in the end game but it would be nice if they didn't feel so underpowered in the leveling process so now after going yeah. over everything talking about diablo 4 content talking about my experience in the review build what i liked what i didn't like how long do i think i will be playing diablo 4 well my guess is it's probably gonna take about two to three weeks before i am geared and leveled up enough to clear the hardest content in the game which yeah, is my plan is to play it until final fantasy 16 and then come back and play it afterwards intermittently and also play uh, uh uh you know like play the season moving through those nightmare dungeons that will scale up right and then eventually taking on that level 100 boss itself which is Kiwi. what blizzard yeah. has said yeah, is basically what... the pinnacle pve challenge and, and in... that's the way that um that's the way arpg seasonal arpgs play like that's what i do in poe also is i play the game a lot i get my character to a plateau and then i move on in the game at the moment now there is of course a never-ending amount of loot that we can grind for as you search for perfect roles and the highest end range values for various attributes and affixes on every piece of gear but for me typically once i am geared to the point where i can clear the hardest or close to hardest content in these games i'm pretty much satisfied with what i've seen so yeah, yeah my guess is that's going to be in the vicinity of two to three weeks maybe up to four depending on my daily playtime. after which you know we could extend the amount of playtime if i'm screwing around with friends 
weapons in PvP, or if I decide to level up a, a new character, which then would add another two to four weeks to my playtime, at which point we'll be nearing the start of Season 1, which... that Yeah, I think I'll probably level up one character, maybe two. I don't think I'll go past two. Maybe I will. There you go. That should line up perfectly, and we'll play through Season 1, and we'll see how long I continue to maintain interest there. A lot of that is going to hinge on how much they mix up this core experience, because, yeah, the core experience... I'm probably looking at about four to six weeks uh, before I feel like I've kind of run through everything and yeah. I'm pretty satisfied with where I'm at. That said, as mentioned earlier, a majority of Diablo 4's long-term success is going to hinge greatly on how substantial and how interesting that seasonal content ends up being. What I can tell you is that while I do think there's room for improvement here and I would have liked to see Blizzard take some bigger swings and try some more innovative stuff, all told, the core of Diablo 4 it's a lot of fun. I really yeah. enjoyed playing through it, and I am pumped to dive in this week and play the game with everyone else. I do have some critiques, but ultimately, the worst part about playing the review build last week is when the servers went offline because I just wanted to keep on playing. And for me, that is a telltale sign that I enjoy a game. That's going to do yeah. it for me today. Thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the vid. I'll see you next time. I think that was a pretty good fucking video. I've seen a lot of the reviews for, for Diablo, and I think pretty much every single one of them has been overwhelmingly positive. Like, there hasn't been a lot of people that have played the game and said that it was bad. Like, maybe there's somebody that I don't know about, but I certainly haven't seen it at all. So yeah, a lot of positive reviews have come out, and uh, they're all bought. Yeah, Blizzard paid everybody, all of the reviews, everybody saying it's good is paid out. Uh, it, it's all a conspiracy and and the game's actually bad. Yeah, for sure. Well, anyway, uh, back to reality. It looks like the game looks pretty good um, and uh, I'm glad to see it and it's awesome. It's crazy to think it's not, well, it's not coming out tomorrow. I guess now it is because it's into the AM. But yeah, holy shit, man. It's so soon. Let me link you guys the video. You guys can give it a like. I think this is a really, really, really well put together video. Hmm. If you were to believe chat, the game sucks. A lot of people that like the game aren't really sitting around talking about how great the game is going to be. They're just waiting for the game. Whereas the people that don't like the game are trying to talk about how bad it's going to be. Ultimately, what am I going to go off of more than anything? I'm going to go off of my experience playing the game. And at the end of the day, my experience playing the game was extremely positive. I liked playing the game. So I think that I will also like playing the full game. You defended Overwatch 2? Yeah, I did. I thought that Overwatch 2 was fine. Like, I enjoyed playing the game, but... I mean, I'm not just going to play that forever. Sure. Yeah, I thought the gameplay was fine. I mean, there were things about it that annoyed me, but... Yeah, I mean, Blizzard canceled the PvE. So, like, that sucks. And it was also free. I mean, fuck, man. How does it compare to Diablo 3, if not basically the same as a reskin? Is it a reskin? I mean, not really. I mean, like, how is, like... I mean, is, like... It, what makes it a reskin? Will this game have ping issues for Southeast Asia? If you play an American server, yeah, probably. What if Diablo 4 is bad? Somehow, does Blizzard ever recover from it? I don't know. I mean, here's the thing is that I will just watch a, uh, I'll just watch a game and make my own best decision on if I'm going to play it or not. Like, I, I don't want to sit around and start writing blank checks and saying, oh, well, I'm never going to buy another game from Blizzard or I'm always going to buy games from Blizzard or, you know, anything like that. I'm just going to make the decision based off of if the game looks fun to play or not. Like, and, and then I'll look at the way that people play it. I'll look at gameplay and then make a, an informed decision. Like, I, I don't want to start, like, making these, like, proclamations of, oh, well, I'm not going to play any of these types of games or that types of games. Well, I don't know. It depends on what happens. Watch my stream and then you'll know. I just think that's the smart thing to do. Is, like, instead of taking people's word for it, seek out the information for yourself and then look for yourself. And make your own decision off of that. That's the smart thing to do. What do you think of the armor sets in the game? I think it's fine. What we'll also do is be skeptical of monetization after they lied by omission by being able to buy power in Diablo Immortal. Yeah, uh, Diablo Immortal was a huge L. It was disappointing to, I think, everybody in the community. It was exactly what people hoped that it wouldn't be. 
And uh, yeah, that's it. And I think that obviously the Diablo team has to, uh, you know, it, it's they're going to have to work pretty hard to regain that trust that they completely lost during Diablo Immortal. Yeah, I think so too. What happened to Overwatch 2 stopped me from buying Diablo 4 because I feared the day that they'll fuck everything up because Bobby wants more money, will come sooner or later, and I played the beta and I enjoyed it. Well, like, why are you making decisions on if you're going to play a game or not based off of two years into the future? Like, I, I don't know, like, if... <laughs> I, I think that's psychotic. Uh, well, it, I don't know what's going to happen to a video game in two years. I mean, most video games, like, I mean, uh, under that logic, like, why would you even play a single-player game, for example? Because you just play the single-player game, then it's done. Like, I, I don't know, maybe I guess it doesn't change, so that's a little bit different. But usually, like, you know, I can go back and play Diablo 3, and it's basically the same game I played in 2012. It's just that, you know, it's, it's better than it was. So I don't know. Early reviews are great for Diablo 4. Yeah. And I think that the truth is, like, a lot of people would have shit on Diablo 4 if it was bad. And, and a lot of the criticisms that people have for Diablo 4 are just, like, it, it's like they don't make any sense. I feel like uh, seasons restarting your progress to zero sucks. Well, they don't restart your progress to zero. You keep your character in the Eternal Realm. Who told you that it resets your, your progress? They explicitly said that's not going to happen. Th this, see, this is what I'm talking about, right? It's like people that have criticism of the game that's just, like, not true. I, I, I don't even know what to say. People are just so eager to take a dumb on Blizzard for any reason at all. Yeah, exactly. I'm also getting tired for all the hate for these games that comes out. Most of the content creators, uh, uh, we work hard doing reviews, trying to tell people if the game is good or not, and people just want to act like incels instead. I think that a lot of people just want to, people want to have like these, the uh, skeptical opinion because it makes them feel smart. It makes them feel like, oh, well, uh, we are like, I'm the one that sees through the truth. I'm the one who's able to, you know, I can understand and see through the hype, stuff like that. Yeah, the I told you so mentality. Exactly. Uh, people just like to hate on Blizzard sometimes for the memes. Oh yeah, no doubt. I have no doubt that's happening. I don't even care. I bought a hundred dollar version of the game. It took a week off work. It's gonna be awesome. Well, fucking uh, enjoy it, man. Yeah, there you go. People just have zero trust in Blizzard. I don't need to trust Blizzard. I don't care if they ruin the game a month after it comes out. I'm gonna play the game so much in that one month that I'm gonna get my money's worth out of it, and if I never play it again after that, I'll be totally fine. There are a lot of games that I played, like, uh, uh, let me think of some examples, right? I mean, like, uh, fuck. Let's see, how many, how many of these games, like, I played, like, once or twice, and then I felt like I got my money's worth out of them? Cuphead. Like, I played Cuphead, and I beat the game, and I never really played it again. And I definitely feel like I got my money's worth for it. And I was super happy that I bought the game. Uh, Hades. I played it for, you know, a little bit under 40 hours. I beat all the content. And I feel like I totally got my money's worth and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and these are just games that I finished. Some of these I didn't finish. Like Hollow Knight and Have a Nice Death. I, I didn't finish either of these games. Uh, which other ones are we at? Uh, needy streamer overload. I played this one a few times and, uh, you know, cut my money and then I was happy. Millionaire, ta millionaire, by the way, you think you need to be a millionaire to afford a $70 game? Bro, I'm going to be real. Okay. People might not want to hear this, but it's the truth. If you can't afford a $70 game and you live in the U S or another Western, like first world co developed country, the last of your problems is the pricing of video games. You need to stop thinking about video games. You need to stop watching streams at 3 in the fucking morning about video games. And you need to get your fucking life together. Straight up real shit. And how do I know that? Because I was in the exact same spot. I was doing the exact same shit. I know it from experience. So yeah, I don't, I don't want to fucking hear about how this is a problem for you or whatever. Uh, could just be a kid or a teenager. Yeah, maybe. Um, you really think that you need to finish the game 100% uh, to review it? Like, the leveling experience be such a letdown that you stop at 40 or 50% completion? I think that the best reviews are the ones that are completely comprehensive that come from somebody who's played every aspect of the game. I think the second best are people who played certain aspects of the game to very deep levels, and they basically add a disclaimer into the review 
that it is explicitly not taking into account other features of the game. Like, for example, I've done reviews of games, and I'm like, okay, I did not do this. Like, for example, in, uh, in Valheim, like, whenever I did the review for the Mistlands content, I explicitly said I didn't do any of the magic stuff because I just didn't think it was cool. I thought just, you know, having big weapons and killing things like that is way cooler. So I think that you just have to preface it by saying what you spend your time on and what you don't spend your time on.